Good morning. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 this morning. And uh, if you would go ahead and be turning there. And when you get there, pause. And, and we're just going to take a moment. Uh, I know we've prayed a couple times this morning, but, but I just want to take a moment to pause uh, just to have a little time of, of silence uh, in prayer individually. And then, um, and then I'll conclude with, with a prayer. Um, if you're here visiting with us this morning, I just want to say it's our supreme joy to have you as a part of our gathering. Um, we're a family of Christ trying to seek Him and, and learn what it means to follow Him day in and day out. And we're so glad that you're a part of who we are this morning. And, and for our family members, we know um, the weeks bring a lot of ups and downs, don't they? They, they really do. There's a lot of uh, ebbs and flows within the cycle of seven days. And some of those are bring us to our peaks and our joyous moments and, and times to celebrate. And some of them bring us to, to points of, of just utter exhaustion. And, and we don't know anything else to do but just to fall down before the Lord. And know if wherever you are, that God hears your heart and He sees what's there. And um, He intercedes for us in groanings and utterings too deep for words. And uh, I found it to be true that, that sometimes when I don't know what to pray, perhaps just being with Him in silence, He He hears that. You know, He hears what's in our heart in the midst of the silence, and and He He knows that. So so let's just take a moment to to, to be silent before Him, and then I'm going to close out with a prayer. Lord Jesus, Father and Spirit, we come before You this morning thanking You for the opportunity we have to gather and celebrate Your presence among us. We also pray for those who are hurting among our family this morning. Um, both our family here, our family at Wilson Avenue and, and elsewhere in, in this community. Um, we pray you be with the Eastlick family and all the family and friends that they have. God, give them a immense uh, feeling of peace within and help them to lean into one another through this time. Father, we pray for, for all in our community who are unwell or are struggling, whether with physical ailments, whether with uh, addictions, wherever they are, um, God, we ask that You come in and show them that You are their rescue and their hope. Lord God, we ask for those who are, who are struggling um, in, in all various capacities. But Lord, we also ask that You be with, with others who just the day-to-day stress and the day-to-day -day struggle and the day-to-day -day, uh, sort of mundane that, that can kind of encompass us and, um, and kind of shadow Your light from us, God. We, we just ask that, that Your light pierce through for all of them as well. Lord God, we thank You for giving us this morning to gather. And we pray that You open up our hearts and our minds and our mind's eye to Your Word to have deep understanding and to uh, walk in Your way a little more closely this upcoming week. Father, help us to understand as we embark on 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 comes in this section that we've been talking about uh, beginning last week. Well, in the whole book where, he's, where Paul's kind of addressing all these challenges, all these problems that's going on in the church of Corinth. And, and last week we looked at, in chapter 8, where he starts talking about our liberty as Christians. Yes, you are free to do many things. In fact, in Christ, you really have true freedom in the fullest sense. You know, we talk about freedom. We talk about fighting for freedom. We talk about the ideals of freedom. We talk about freedom from a, a sociopolitical sense. Uh, from a law sense. We, we talk about freedom in lots of different ways, but it's only in Christ that true liberation of the soul can be found. Because you can have a lot of external freedoms and still be in bondage internally. And so it's only through Christ that that level of freedom 
exist. And so Paul is saying, look, you have this liberty about you. But that doesn't mean that everything you do is conducive to your brothers and sisters. That you need to be mindful, you need to be thoughtful, you need to be careful about how you walk in this world because there's others that are watching what you do and trying to walk and follow in your steps. And what kind of, kind of example are you setting for them? How are you mentoring them? So he talked about that in chapter 8, and he talked about not setting up a stumbling block and being thoughtful about those who are weak in the faith. And, and he talks about it in such a way that he says, when you, when you kind of cross this boundary with another believer, um, when you cause them to stumble, you're not just hurting them, you're actually doing it to Christ, which is a pretty extreme and powerful statement. And so he ends chapter 8 by saying, Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother or sister to stumble. And, and he's dealing with some specific things in that context. Well, he's continuing some of this thought, and, and thematically this parallels chapter 8 and chapter 9. And he's still talking about how we use our liberty. But he's tying it into the whole scope of how we live the Christian life. And Logan, you may have to click it. It's not. There we go. And so he uses this metaphor in chapter nine of a race. And we're going to get to that towards the end of the chapter. But he talks about sort of running this race. I'm not going to ask a show of hands, but how many of you have run a race before? For some of us, it was as a young child, right? Racing out on the schoolyard. For some of us, it may have been just last week. Or we may be running a race here in a couple weeks. Um, but when you do a race, it requires discipline. It requires training. It requires sort of cultivating the attributes that you need to run. Right? I mean... People were really, God created us to run. Anatomically, that's the way we were created. We were created to do that. Um, we weren't created to run on rock all the time. <laughs> that's why a lot of people have injuries when they run. But we were created to run. And so when we are talking about this idea of a race, and we think about how we live our lives, the question is, is we were created to run in this race. The question is, is which one are you running in? You know, it's interesting because a lot of people run on treadmills and treadmills are great and they're, they're okay and they're fine and do that as opposed to not doing anything. But when you run on a treadmill, everything's controlled, isn't it? The environment's controlled. The speed is controlled. The pace is controlled. The, the elevation is controlled. And the thing I hate most about treadmills is no matter how fast you run, you don't go anywhere. Have you ever thought about that? You don't go anywhere. You stay in the same place. That's why they give you things to distract you when you go to a gym, right? They put a TV in front of there. Because... No one that I know of in their right mind likes to run as hard as they can and never move anywhere. But I'm convinced that many of us in our lives, that's what kind of race we're running right now. We're running to the maximum. We are exceeding the limits of what we are created to do. And yet we're staying immobile. We're in the exact same place day after day and year after year. And we keep running faster and we keep running harder and we keep kind of putting new things in front of us and we haven't moved one step. We haven't moved one step. The second question when we get into this, before we get into this chapter, is whatever race you are running, why are you running it? I mean, when you think about, okay, what is it that is taking the most attention and time and efforts and energies and focus on my part right now in my life? What is that for you? What is it that you see out there that you're running towards? 
Not what you think you should be, but what are you? And I think for all of us, we would have a different answer to that question. But I'm convinced that we live in a society that doesn't encourage us to ask the question. It just says, get in there and do. Get in there and run. Do this day in and day out. And don't think about it. Just get in there and do it. And one day you'll get there. But it's never really clearly defined as to where the there is you're trying to get to. What the end game of where you're running towards. And so Paul uses this, this metaphor to talk about our spiritual life. And I want you to just kind of keep this in your mind as we go through this as to what am I running towards and why am I running towards it? I mean, what is it that I think will bring me gain? Am I running towards Christ? Am I running towards security? Am I running towards freedom? Am I running towards uh, pleasure? Am I running towards uh, personal gain? Am I running towards uh, a reputation? Am I running towards this ideal that I have for myself as to who I'm supposed to be? I want you to think about that. Just let that kind of sink in for a minute as we go through. And I'm not going to go through every little piece of this in, in as great of detail because I want to spend most of the time on the end of the chapter. But, but we'll talk through some of this um, beginning in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And again, this connects with chapter 8. So he says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? And he's talking to them at Corinth. If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? And again, he's connected this with some of the conversation we had a few weeks ago about uh, whether it was right to marry at all and the spiritual pride they had around that issue. And and Paul here is kind of connecting with that, saying we all have a right to, to marry. Do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? I'm not speaking of these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does the law not also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is He? Or is He speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written, because the plowman ought to plow in hope, and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we do not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the Gospel of Christ. And I'm going to stop there for just a moment. And again, knowing chapter 8 is critical to understanding what he's talking about in chapter 9. He's saying, as an apostle and as a minister of the Gospel, Paul and Barnabas and all of them, they have a right to receive gain and profit from their work. Just like someone who plants a vineyard or plants a field surely will glean some sort of return for planting the apples, right? Or planting the grapes or planting whatever it is that they plant. And Paul here is saying, look, we have this right. This is good, and this is even in the law for us to be allowed to do so. But he's saying, because of the pride that is among you, I'm choosing not to partake in my Christian liberty. You see what I'm saying? He's using this as an analogy. I'm choosing not to partake in my Christian liberty because I don't want it to cause offense among you and the, and the uh, promulgation and spread of the Gospel. Okay. So he's using his own life, he's using his own work ethic as an example to them to say, look, even though I have this right and should be able to do this, and there's perfectly no reason why I cannot do this, I'm choosing not to exercise it because of your sake. Just like you, church at Corinth, have right to do many, many things, to eat meat that is sacrificed to idols because you realize that idols are not real at all but it's maybe not wise for you to do so because of your weaker brothers and sisters. Okay, This is all a conceptual unit. And that's the case he's making here. But it's really interesting before I move forward, he says to cause no hindrance to the good news 
of the Messiah. Right? If you recall, in Jesus' life, there were two different occasions where Jesus marveled. Something caused Jesus to, to step back and, and marvel at what He is seeing. Both of them concern faith. One was when, the, I think it was the centurion had great faith. right? And the other was when they had no faith at all. And if you recall in that instance, it says that He could do no great work there. Are there things, boundaries, barriers that we can erect in our lives that might prohibit the power and the good news of Jesus to infiltrate those areas and bring renewal? Are there things we can do to disrupt that? It's, it's an important question. Are there things that we can do to set up barriers and roadblocks for others that might keep them from hearing the life-saving good news of Jesus? Well, Paul here is saying that there are. So verse 13, he says, Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. But I have used none of these things, and I am not writing these things so that it will be done so in my case, for it would be better to me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. And again, he's connecting all this with that prior discussion, using himself as an illustration to state Though I have freedom and, and perfect legitimacy to do so, I'm not exercising that right because of the Gospel. Verse 19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the Gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Paul's saying, look, I have perfect freedom and liberty to do a multitude of things. But because of the solidarity that I have with my brothers and sisters, because of my love and concern for others, I do not exercise them. In fact, I try to empathize and become one of them. Right? Whatever station in life they are, I don't overlook them. I try to see into them. Whatever station in life they are, I don't try to pass them off. I don't try to disregard them. I don't try to speak over them or use my superior knowledge or my position. He says, I humble myself. Not for my sake, for the sake of the gospel in their life, right? So I can partake in this good news with them. We can celebrate this together, no matter where they are. And we get we get kind of caught up in our minds, right? And and, and we kind of have these these ways of thinking where we <laughs> have you ever noticed how interesting this is that we can peer into someone else's life and with perfect clarity tell them everything that's going wrong and how to fix it. You notice that? I mean, just within, I mean, we can hear something on the news and within two minutes we have the solution to that. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm the only one that's ever done that, but uh, 
I challenge you to go to a restaurant on any morning and sit and listen. And there, are, I guarantee you, there will be groups there who are talking about the issues of the world and they've got it all figured out. They just don't do anything with it, right? It's just like, we've got it figured out. They just need to come to ask us. You know? We do that. We do that. I mean, we hear of a situation and we immediately assess it and say, well, this is what they need to do. This is how they need to fix it. And yet, we're pretty myopic about our own selves, right? Pretty blind to the challenges that we have ourselves or, or how to go about fixing those or even what the problems are. We're, we're a little bit, we're not really as self-aware as we think we are. And, and Paul here is saying, look, when I'm peering into the life of the other, you know, I, I've used that example before, but I love how Augustine described who we are as a self. He said, we're like these rooms. And the room is open at the top. Imagine we're all here in this room and, and the top is open and the light is shining down in this room and that light is the light of God shining into us. And when we look out the room, we see out the window and out that window is another self. There's another person. It's you. Or for you, it's me. And in this life, we're always peering through that window. But in eternity, the room will be gone. The windows will be gone. And we'll see each other in the fullness and honest transparency. For our fullness, redeemed in Christ. When you look out the window at the other, the person who's outside of it, what do you see? Who do you see? Do you just see a wreck? You see other people who are like, they're all just a mess and, and there's no hope for them. Do you look out the window and you see, well, some of them are okay and some of them I'd rather not associate with. Some of them chagrin me or they, they make me feel uncomfortable or they're, they're whatever it is you want to term. Because human life is so complex. Paul's essentially saying, to use the metaphor, when I look out the window, I see someone that I love and want to share the good news and celebrate the good news of Jesus with. Because I understand that freedom in its fullness only happens through Him. And I want that light of God shining in their life and their room just like He's shining in mine. That's what Paul is getting at here. That wherever they are, whatever type of bondage they are in, when you look out your own eyes and you see another, do you see them with the love of Jesus? Do you see them as an eternal soul? I don't know that we always do that. We see them for the frustrations we have with them. We see them for um, the inadequacies that we see in them. We see them for the mess in their situation that they're in. We don't look out and see them as a eternally beloved soul that God created and needs His light. But that's exactly what Paul is modeling here. To the weak I became weak. Though I'm free from all, I've made myself a slave to all. Man, that's powerful. Verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. In ancient Corinth, and I was talking to Jamie a little bit about this this week, uh, when I was reading up over this, it was interesting because nearby they had what was called the Ismian Games. And uh, you most likely heard of the Olympics. Well, this was second in popularity and in attendance to the Olympics. Pretty important for them. For the Ismian Games, um, they had to prepare, they had to show proof that they had been training for 10 months for this game. And the 30 days prior to the game, they had to train in the gymnasium under the oversight of those holding the games to ensure that they had made what they needed to do, that they had made the efforts that they needed to make to be uh, 
to be eligible to compete in this event. Okay. I recall some years ago, um, I trained for a half marathon. And I did it with, I say I did it with my brother and my dad. Um, they were way ahead of me. I never saw them the whole race, okay? After they said go, that was it. I mean, they were, they were left me in the dust. But I trained for months and months and months to run this race. And I remember, though I trained for many months, and a half marathon is 13.1 miles, I had only ever gotten to about 10 miles in my prep training which I found out afterward was a mistake. Because I'm like, if I can go 10 miles, I can go another three. I mean, what's another three? You know? Some of you who have done this before are laughing at me right now. Because I get into it, the first couple miles are always hard, and then I hit stride. I felt fine. I mean, it certainly wasn't the fastest or even close, but, but you know, it was going mile five, I felt fine. Mile six, I felt fine. Mile nine, I, I got this sort of new win. I'm like, man, I could run all day. This is great. Um... Mile 10 happened, and uh, that feeling I had was only momentary. <laughs> because at mile 10, I went from feeling like I could run all day to feeling like someone had just strapped concrete blocks to my legs. And I'm like, I have three more miles to go. <laughs> and um, I did it. Uh, not with any finesse, or uh, it was pretty ugly, to say the least. Um, and sure, perseverance certainly played a part. But I think it was the encouragement seeing others right there beside me, kind of pulling along the way, like, you're almost there. You know, you could do this. I don't know how they were talking at that point, but we're just sort of running through. And um, it really, one, gave me a new level of respect for those who, who do this on a regular basis. But two, I think it really helped me to understand what Paul is talking about here. He said, we all are running in a race. All of us. But how are you training for it? You know, they all received a prize, and in those days, they would receive a wreath made of celery. Um, that was what it was composed of. And, and this, but it perished quickly, Right? And he's saying they went through such extremes and such extent to compete for something that within a matter of hours wilts and dies away. Everyone who competes, verse 25, in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. What race are you running? Why are you running it? And how are you training in that race, for that race? See, unlike running on a treadmill, which will only ever keep you in one spot, when you get out inside, outside, which I much rather prefer, trail running, you're in the elements, right? It's not controllable. You cannot control the elements. You cannot control the circumstances. You cannot control the terrain. You cannot control whether you're in the midst of your run, it's going to come a torrential downpour and storm. You cannot control if something happens when you're three miles out and you get an injury. I mean, there are things you could do to help, but you don't know. When you're outside on the trail, you're in the elements. And there's so many unknowns. How do you prepare and train for that kind of race? You know, when I was in Texas, they asked us this question, or they told us when folks back home ask you what you're doing down here, uh, tell them this. You're preparing for you know not what. How do you prepare for the very thing that you cannot see and know that's coming? Because those things that you cannot see and know that's coming, those are the elements on the trail. And those are the things that's going to shape you and form you the most in your life. And yet, they're the things that we don't even think about that could happen or we don't prepare for. How do we prepare for that? 
Paul here is talking about that very thing. Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. This is a deeply challenging passage to me as one who preaches every week. Because when you look at yourself, you oftentimes see your inadequacies, right? When you look in the mirror, you don't say, perhaps we shouldn't say this because it sounds boastful, but we don't look in the mirror and say, look how beautiful of a creation of God I am. Okay. Now, if I hear you saying that in the bathroom, I won't think anything about it because we just talked about it, okay? But when you look in the mirror, what do you start to do? You notice your failures, right? You notice your flaws. You, you start to pinpoint all these things. And in truth, those things are beautiful as well. But Paul here is saying, I discipline myself. I make it my slave. I bring it under subjection. I realize that I am not perfect but I live a life that leads to preparation and running the race so that I can win. This race is a marathon in the fullest sense. It's lifelong. And it's not on a treadmill. Though I think sometimes we would prefer it that way. We would prefer to control the elements. We would prefer to control the speed. We would prefer to control the elevation. We would prefer to be distracted the whole time watching a screen. But what kind of life is that? What kind of God would He be if He put us in a life like that? It's the brevity. It's this sort of ephemeral nature of life. It's the uncertainty that makes each moment so pertinent and valuable. It's the elements that we can't foresee that keep us disciplined and keep us striving for something that is imperishable, and unending, and invaluable. Sometimes dissatisfaction in this life, sometimes the pains and the toils of this life are both a reminder that we're alive but also a reminder that this isn't home. Sometimes the dissatisfactions is what actually makes hope a flame. And it keeps us looking upward. Whereas if not, we would just look to the self. It's a reminder that He is our Father and this is our pilgrimage. And that He's leading us on a good way. We trust Him for that for every step. Paul's saying, don't just walk in that way. Run on it. Don't just walk down that trail. Run that trail. Know that He is running right there beside you the whole way. You know, To me, running that half marathon was so significant. Not because it was a half marathon, but because I got to do it with my dad and my brother. And it was going to be my dad's last long race he did. Though sometimes I wonder if he may go back on that statement. <laughs> but I got to do it with them, right? Knowing that they were at the finish line waiting for me. And that I was almost there. I just had to persevere that last three miles. Your father is waiting at the finish line. And the elements are hard and the rains and the storms can be torrential. And there's all kinds of potholes along the trail and there's all kinds of barriers and there's all kinds of false ways that you may get caught up in. And sometimes there's people there to encourage you along the way and that's what Paul's trying to get them to do. And sometimes there's people there who are putting roadblocks up so that you take the wrong path. But at the end of that trail, God's there with open arms waiting for you, saying, you're home. And that will never perish. So run this race with zeal, 
with fervor and passion for something that will never end, something that's ultimate happiness, ultimate joy, ultimate fulfillment, because it's not about anything in this life or about us. It's about being one with our Father. And so, how are you running the spiritual race? Where are you at in that journey? For some of you, you may have just stepped on the trail. You're like, I don't, I don't really know what all this is about. I, I think the treadmill felt a little safer. For some of you, you've been on the trail a long time and you're like, is this thing ever going to end? What is going on? Day in and day out. Just so much. Some of you are approaching that finish line and understand what many of us here need to know that we all run it with passion. That we all, if we continue to persevere on the way, know that God is good amidst it all. God is still good. You've been on this trail a long time and you can attest to the fact that God is good. And then there's some of you who have never stepped on the trail yet and you don't really know. And you're like, well, why is he talking about running up there? <laughs> and what does all this mean? And, and um, well, when I think of all the ways to think about life, the metaphor that I think hits most closely to its reality is a journey. And if you never started that journey with Jesus, then whether you recognize it or not, you're on the treadmill. And, you know, it seems fine for a while. But eventually, that gets old. And the way you think your life should go, eventually is going to get old. And you're going to come to this point to where you say, there's got to be more. At that point, that is where you find Jesus' outstretched hand saying, come and let me show it to you. And if you've not stepped onto that trail with Him, His hand is extended for you as we stand and as we sing.